felt like they were like my kids. I mean, if um, Larissa would have let me kidnap them, I would have. And so I would just tell them I loved them every day. And then they would tell me that they loved me back. And it was just like my favorite moment of the day. They're never gonna have a disability because disabilities limit you. My name is um, Terrence R. Chisholm. Um, a lot of people um, still call me Dr. Chisholm. I've been working in the field of kids that have a lot of um, disabilities for the past 17 years. And within that field, it, the range has been with kids with autism, always with psychiatric issues. However, the kids with autism, I have always found to be probably the greatest and most difficult challenges. Autism spectrum disorder is the, um, the classification that we use now to describe kids on the spectrum. My name is the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Claire Roddy and um, I have ended a 57 year career in education. The autism spectrum disorder includes neurological problems that children have. They have what they call delayed development, maybe language, maybe social skills, or and sometimes they have addition to that, they may have some physical uh, disorders too. They are really, um, you will see children in wheelchairs who are also autistic. So you can have two or three different kinds of disabilities when you're on the spectrum. It can range from the child who can barely talk or who can't sit up all the way up to somebody uh, who's like uh, a genius level person, they call it Asperger's. Uh, so there's a very, very wide range and almost every case is classic. It, it, you can't really put it in a box. You can't just have one name for it. I'm Centuria Watson. I'm the executive director of Chester County First Steps. The autism spectrum disorder has to do with children who have their own unique challenges with being able to speak, uh, pick up on verbal as well as body cues that we use as we express ourselves. They also have challenges sometimes even with mobility and being able to walk or um, hand-eye coordination that is critical in reading, math skills and things of that nature. For these children, it is a challenge to put all those pieces together. They eventually do, but on their time frame and not someone else's. There's no scale for them. It can be from very minor, as it is with someone who may have epilepsy. They will have a seizure that may be just a, a brief stare and it's over, to someone who, is a, who has extreme challenges on one side where their um, verbal abilities never come into play where their emotions stay on one level, they're not really emotional, whereas we have highs and lows with ours, theirs is static. It doesn't really change that much. My name is Kelly Marks. I am a self-contained special education teacher. I am in my third year of teaching, and I taught Thomas and James my first year teaching. Autism spectrum disorder is a very broad disorder. It affects um, people in all different ways, communication, um, socialization, learning, it's a very broad term. It's hard to narrow it down on what it is. Um, there's still a lot of research being done. I believe that it affects all people, um, just some more than others. Um, social anxieties, um, learning disabilities, it's just a very broad term. So what is it? It depends on what individual you're referring to. It could be a communication disorder, um, where they don't communicate effectively. Not that they don't communicate, just that they don't communicate like you and I do. 
It could be that they learn differently, maybe with pictures and not with words. It could be that they um, view the world differently. It's just, it's just a different way of individuals communicating and interacting with things. Basically, if you just want to get it on a very simple level to understand it, it's a social and a behavioral problem. And the social and the behavioral problem actually deals with a lot of, as it sounds, social issues. And social issues, you're dealing with their communication. I am Latanya Boyd, and I am the parent educator supervisor for Chester County First Steps here in Chester, South Carolina. Some of the misconceptions is that they can't learn, um, that they all have behavior issues, that they um, cannot do things, and I'm saying this quotes because this is what the term that they use, that normal children um, would, can do, that they will um, not be able to interact socially. So all of those are, are a lot of misconceptions that that people have when it comes to, um, to autism. It's very important to be able to detect it at an early age. The earlier the child is, the better progress that child is gonna make. Kids with um, autism are usually first recognized by the parents. And the parents notice that their kid is not developing from a developmental standpoint along their peers. So for example, a kid might be um, one or two years old and they still are not talking or the communication. So the parents start to um, ask themselves, okay, you know, there's something wrong. Sometimes it's hard for a parent to acknowledge and, and accept that their child may have some challenges when it comes to, um, to uh, reaching, to obtaining different skills. Um, they, they may take it on that they have done something that wasn't right or that um, you know they should have done something differently during the pregnancy or maybe be something that's hereditary. And so it's, it's a struggle for some parents to actually acknowledge that and accept that. But once that acceptance is, um, is made, then the child has a greater probability of, of success when that parent begins to advocate for that child in his or her education. And if it's not the parent, it's usually it's also in the school setting that where the teacher might recognize that there are differences. Well, as a teacher, I think for years we did not know or did not recognize what we thought were slow students. Or we didn't understand why they were slow. We recognized that there was something different about the child, but most of the time uh, we did not accommodate that child's needs. The key to that is understanding and accepting. If we understand that autism is a developmental disorder, then we start to understand that, hey, they do have an issue that to where there are some issues in the brain that's not connecting. So what we do is that we you say, okay, they're a little bit different, but they're different does not mean that they're in a less. Actually, it means that they just have one particular area that to where they are very strong in. My introduction to Thomas and James actually was through their grandmother, um, Mrs. Roddy, and she, um, asked me to develop a curriculum for them because they were um, having issues in school. And just like a lot of kids with autism, their introduction into the school system is, is a struggle if the school system is not um, adequately prepared to have a program set up for kids with autism. Thomas and James enrolled at the school that I started working at my first year of teaching. Um, they were, um, it was the first year the school was open, or the first year that we were in a new building, actually, not the first year the school was open. It was my first year teaching, and it was their first year in um, a school setting after being homeschooled. Um, they came in, they enrolled, and then um, after we got their educational records, we found out they needed a self-contained setting, 
which the school did not actually have at that time. So it was just going to be them and a teacher. And I willingly volunteered to be that teacher. All right, go James. My name is James Roddy. My name is James Roddy. I am running for student council. When I started to get to know Thomas and James, it was a big learning curve for both of us. Um, I had to do a lot of research on autism. I knew that there were triggers just from college. I knew that there were different ways to teach just from college, but what you learn in the textbook and what you see actually in the classroom is very different. Um, Thomas and James had not been in a classroom, so it was different for them. Um, and we just learned from each other. So what I know of autism is that it's not a disability, it's just different. Their environment is very supportive. And their grandmother and mother did not let that disability um, disable them in accepting of who they were. Uh, I was extremely surprised when I first met them how much they were um, able to do a lot of things that kids at their age with autism wasn't able to do. For example, um, having chores, uh, making um, simple things um, for breakfast, like um, making toast. They were, um, they could do eggs, scramble eggs and things like that. So even having the ability to, um, you know, use the stove and work the stove and to um, go and maneuver throughout the refrigerator and get things like that. I was amazed. Welcome to James and Thomas's home. They have a very specific routine that they follow. They come in, they have a place where they put their coats and their book bags, and they always take their shoes off so they got a shoe rack. Now, the, after they do that, the first place they go to is to their kitchen. And Their favorite foods are here. They know where their pans are. They use the stove, the microwave, and then they have a grill that they use. And if they don't find anything in here that they want to eat, they go to the freezer. And as you can see, it's overflowing because we buy two of everything. We never run out. And once they've eaten, they go to their favorite pastime, either watching television or on the computer. <laughs> okay, so what have we found today, Thomas? Which of your favorite programs have you found? They're interested in all subjects, from astronomy to zebras. Another passion of Thomas and James is music. So one will get on the piano and the other one on the organ. Sometimes uh, Jay will play and Tom will sing or the other way around. Up here you will find self-portraits of Thomas and James. This is one of my favorite pictures. My boys are five months old. This is their first official portrait. And this is the way I always remember them. Because it's after this time at six months old, when they went in the preschool program with First Steps, that we start hearing about there might be some uh, differences, that they had some developmental needs. And so this is the picture that I hold very dear to my heart, because these are my boys. It has been an experience is really, I get very emotional about it because um, it's, it's a wonderful experience, but also it's one that requires a lot of energy because as you get older, you have less energy. But I give them as much attention as I can. Um, they are very, very unique people. They are identical twins, but they're two very, very different people. Um, and it astounds me sometimes the things that they can do. 
when they were about three years old and they were in the PET program, they were doing things that six and eight years old children could do. Now they're doing things looking at um, physics, um, astronomy, the, what, the wide ranges of ser services are things that they look at. When I go and check their history on the computer, it just amazes me what they are looking at, the kinds of subjects they're looking at. They're interested, always have been, in how does it work, how is it made. When they were little, they would get under the table to look to see how the legs were joined on, that kind of thing. So they, they listen to motors now, sounds. So they just haven't been able to articulate, but I think through their creative side, in their, Jay is learning how to play the piano, Tom too, they're teaching themselves to play the piano. Um, they're doing in their drawings and some of their works I look at and say, well, okay, how did they feel this day? What are they trying to tell me in their painting? children, they start drawing on the walls, on the refrigerators, <laughs> on the appliances, you know, all, the, all little children do that. Uh, but when they began kindergarten, you know, they give them the runoff, um, the ditto sheets, the mimograph sheets, to color like the pumpkins, the seasons, whatever. But at home, if you just gave them a piece of paper and some crayons, they would just create a picture, whatever whatever they felt like, whatever their mood was like. And so we use that as one of their recreational activities. And it was always a way, even for me in the classroom, aside from art class, to do extension activities with them because they really focused on that art more than like the academics. So if I wanted them to really, to calm down, if they were upset, if I could tell that they were about to be upset and I wanted them to calm down, they could do that through art if they were really excited about something and I wanted to know exactly what they were excited about, I could, you know, kind of figure it out through their artwork. Um, it was a way that we could kind of use like nonverbal communication with each other. It was a way for us to express emotion with each other. Um, and then it was just a way for them to be rewarded if they have done a lot of hard work. Kids that are on the spectrum and they have this intense um, love for something, they would display that love. It seems like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. That's all they focus on. So if for us, it would become aggravating, but we have to understand that's them. So if we are able to reach that child or even that adult through that world that they are very restrictive in, then you would start seeing the child with autism perform at, at levels that are unbelievable. From the very beginning pictures when they were little, very primitive type of drawing, you know, the circles not made exactly like circles. You, you could make out it was a square or a triangle or whatever. Or if they were doing people or figures, they would be very elementary. We shared a wall with the art teacher. Um, she was awesome. And so one day, um, I think her class had been painting or something the day before, and Thomas didn't want to come to class. So he had stopped and was um, verbalizing to her that he wanted to use the paintbrushes. And so instead of, you know, fighting him, making him come to class, the art teacher had said, you know, like, why doesn't he just wait and paint for a few minutes? And so from that, we saw that he responded really well to art, and then James did 
as well he joined in and so what we did is that, that like twice a week in the mornings the art teacher would work with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and do art projects and it was interesting to see that they would be very proud of certain art pieces and then not so proud of other ones you know like when to us it just looked like art they really felt a certain way about the art that they created and so if they were creating something and they messed up they would you know throw it in the trash can and start all over they were very particular about their art and when the finished product came about they were very proud of that they have gone to art camp um, each summer they go to a special camp and they have arts and crafts as part of it they went to camp Jen this past summer that's part of the program one of the things I've noticed is that they put their name in their works sometimes it's their name but it's how they put it on the paper and the colors that they use and it actually looks like a person or a animal or a tree they it's very very creative they have a unique way of saying I am Thomas I am James their art had gone from just you know like a few um, lines here and there to like actual art of animals and people and scenery so as they got more confident in their abilities to be able to create I think at the beginning they were like not afraid but they they didn't want to mess up they were afraid of messing up and after they kind of got over that and realized that if they do mess up they throw it away they start over they really started creating like really awesome art pieces that they were very proud of. Last year they were 10 years old and I had over 150 pieces of work that they had done since they started and it was become, becoming a um, storage problem. I took it to a framer, he went through them and I think he picked out about eight he thought that were worthy of framing. I'm Theo Wilson, a person who's been collecting artwork for the last 45 years, matting and framing for the last 25 years, and I've been very impressed uh, with the work done by these young guys, and I'm very happy and fortunate to be able to mat and frame some of their work. At one of my wife's uh, family reunions, uh, their grandmother was there, so she approached me and said that her grandsons had his artwork. She had heard that I did matting and framing, and she wanted me to take a look at them and give her an idea of what I thought they were they were worthy of doing something. With. So uh, I, uh, we went by her house, and basically they were a collection of, of art uh, papers in, in a basket, basically. So I bought them here and, and went sorted through them, divided them up from the ones that I thought were uh, appropriate and that I could. Uh, enhance them by matting and framing them. They were advanced for the ages, for what a typical young kid of the age would, would do. But, you know, I've matted and framed and seen all types of things from you know, kindergarten up to high school, which I've done for, for various people. But for their ages, uh, the, the work was more advanced. You could tell that uh, they had uh, some level of talent. What surprised me was you could look at a piece of art from each one and they were very similar. That was kind of unique because normally an, an artist is more of an individual talent. The minds don't think the same, but that is the one thing that struck me with their artwork, that, that each of uh, their artwork is very similar. Art is a very expressive way for them to communicate. So when I was told about their extraordinary ability and when I saw what they were doing in their art, I wasn't surprised. Because um, don't forget, art is an expression and it's a way people communicate. This is an art. This is your way of communicating. Singers, that's an art. That's their way of communicating. So you have a lot of people actually in the field of um, artistic things that are on the spectrum because that's their way of expressing themselves. So when I saw their work, I was not surprised. What surprised me actually was the level of the work. 
because of their age. Um, Thomas and James did not like to really write with anything at the beginning of the year. Um, getting them to write with a pencil or a crayon or a pen, it was very difficult. Um, they didn't really want to do what I was asking them to do. Um, so if we did it in a way that was artistic, if I gave them a paintbrush instead of a pencil, or if I had them trace letters with pastels instead of markers, they responded better to that. And by the end of the school year, they were writing with pencils and pens and all sorts of things, sentences, words. So it helped them to grow, not only in their artwork, but academically as well. Because of their extraordinary ability with, with art, it has opened up other avenues for them to be successful in other areas of their life, not just art, but it, it makes, because they are making, um, being successful here, it opens up the door for them to, to take that and transcend, transcend it to other areas of their life to produce success. In my opinion, um, overcoming the challenges of living with autism has two aspects to it. One aspect of, of being a behavior specialist, understanding that they are unique in their own way. Um, they are who they are. We cannot change them. It's a um, biological issue. It's just something we cannot change. So the, the issue is not of them changing, it's the issue of us changing and learning to accept who they are. Once you acknowledge that something is there, then you can begin to develop strategies for success. And as we learn more about the spectrum, dispelling those misconceptions, so that others who come in contact and who have an influence and, 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 and interact with children who have uh, autism, not just children, but even adults um, who have autism, that we will not treat them less than they are. It's gonna be a three-pronged process. One is parents. Parents cannot be in denial. You can't say there's nothing wrong with my, your child and your child is four years old and they're not talking. Or your child does not look you in the eye. Your child is lapping, which is just running and have, have other symptoms. And you just ignore them because you want your child to be like everybody else's child. So once somebody says, you know, I think you might want to get your child tested, parents have to stop being in denial because they can help that child if that child is under the age of three and you realize there's some delayed development, then you need to take that child right then and start getting them services. And then when you become a parent, do not accept everything that's told you. The diagnosis, that's the first diagnosis, that's the initial diagnosis. Your child will not always be like that. So do not always accept what the teacher says, what the doctor says, research for yourself, ask questions, don't believe everything you read, know your child. Second, in the educational system, we've got to train teachers so that they will recognize this and so that if you are teaching social studies and you have a child that's having a problem, you will know to pass it on and get some help for that child. We've got to recognize it. We've got to realize that you cannot go by your textbook. That is a guide and it will not fit every child. You're going to have to throw out your syllabus sometimes and even give a child, a, write a new totally new syllables for that one particular child. But that child deserves the same amount of energy as you put into your advanced students. The third thing is we're going to have to have funding. Our legislators are going to have to realize it takes more money for a special needs child. So you're going to have to have more teachers, more aides. You're going to have to allow uh, these students to have shadows somebody who can be in the classroom with them. So when they get frustrated and they started acting out, there's somebody who works with them every day who can calm that child down. I believe that people who are in the system and in the business of working with children really do care about them. It is frustrating for them to have not the things that they need to provide for the children what they um, need, but the 
they don't have control over resources or monies or funding to bring these services in. And when budgets are made and when the school board sets their priorities as to what they want to fund and provide resources for, their priority is trying to meet the needs of the children who have a potential for higher academic success, those who may be on the college track, those who they can um, look at, reflect back later and say, well, I played a role in that child becoming an engineer or becoming a teacher and returning to the school system to educate other children. But more attention needs to be made to those who are not going to be on that track and putting monies behind it. Some of them already have the intellectual attention, but the money is not there yet, and nothing is free. It's hard to do things that are meaningful and helpful without um, adequate resources. Knowledge and understanding is the best thing that we can do to advocate and help um, people with autism spectrum disorder. So I think that just continuing to do what I do every day, be an example, um, give these individuals the most normal experiences to show that they're capable. It's not a disability, it's just different. Um, helping them be more um, involved in the community so that the community isn't scared by the word autism. Autism isn't something to be afraid of, but I think it has a negative connotation um, in the general population. I think people hear autism and it's negative. They hear autism and they're scared. They think of, you know, tantrums or freaking out. And the more that we can bring to light that autism is just a different way of learning and a different way of, of needing certain things, it will be more um, beneficial. What I was told and what I see with other children, they will always be like this. However, they're first diagnosed as they're, they're gonna be they'll be blabbering and gibberish, you know, all their whole lives. I've also been told, oh, they're fine, they're gonna be just wonderful, whatever. Neither one of those are true. Somewhere in there is where they actually are. Um, yes, they can't do certain things, but they can do. Now, what they can do and how much they can do depends on that child but let him do what he will and what he can. Don't tell me he cannot do. I don't have can't in my vocabulary. Don't tell me don't. You know, that's a psychological thing, because you tell me don't, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do. So tell the child, yes, you can do this, but you might need some help. Let me help you. And we try to teach our boys and other students that I come in contact with let me give you some help with this. And they are successful. What is success? How do we measure? What is normal? What defines it? So every person is worthy. Every person is precious. So whatever they bring to the table, we want to use it. I probably think my favorite thing about the boys, they were five months old, and we took them to get their first portrait made for his picture together. And I have that picture on my dresser because I think that was the last time they were quote unquote said to be normal. They were healthy, happy little babies with this curly hair, and I have them in this picture, and uh, Tommy is leaning over Jay. They aren't sitting side by side. They're just typical little boys, you know, two little twins. You can't tell one from the other. I really have to strain to look at the picture to see who is who, and I think, remember, that's the picture I have of them, and that's the way they're always going to be for me. They're never going to have a disability because disabilities limit you, and so there are unlimited possibilities.